Amen. Is that your expectation today? I really hope it is. You know, we, we get in these, um, I think, seasons where we need, we just need adjustment. I, I, I have found even in my own life, you guys, that, that I will need throughout the year several, several points of where I go, oops, <laughs> I need to get back on track here. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not where I used to be or where I should be or, or where my habits should be. Is anyone else with me on that? Do you guys ever need realignment, readjustment? Some of you guys know, like in your vehicle, I remember when I got my first vehicle, my first car, it was a Hyundai Accent, stick shift. I, I didn't know anything about cars though, nothing about cars. I didn't know there was routine maintenance, like oil changes and stuff like that. And, and I started riding that thing in the dirt, man. I, and luckily I got, a, I got my, my, my buddy's dad, you know, was, was almost like a dad to me. And as I was getting up there, I mean, this was years ago, this Hyundai Accent wasn't supposed to go 7,000 miles without a without an oil change. Nowadays, you can do that. And almost that's, I think that's like the technology increases. There's less maintenance and like we're just, we, we get accustomed to not maintaining things and readjusting things. But can I tell you, in your spiritual life, you need routine maintenance. You need routine alignment. And that's what this series and this season we're in, we're t- taking this August when kind of back to school and maybe back to normal schedules and things like that, where, where maybe we got off track a little bit on some habits, especially some spiritual disciplines and spiritual habits. We're utilizing this season and this series called Postured to get back into right alignment, to get back into a posture that we're learning that, that God actually is attracted to. There are certain postures There are certain postures of our heart that when God sees it, man, his presence is attracted to it. And there's actually even even promises to those those premises of when we align ourselves to God. Our theme verse is in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. This is actually given to Solomon. This this promise was given to Solomon after he built uh, the temple. And we're going to talk about that a little more today. But God tells him, like, if you ever get off track, you ever need alignment, He says, if my people, my God-defined people, if you ever get to that place where you need adjustment, if you just humble yourself, and we talked about that last week, the posture of humility and how God just responds. And honestly, that is the, that without humility, it's the soil that every fruit of the spirit is produced in. Without humility, there is no pleasing God. He says, if you just humble yourself, if you pray, if you just pray, and we talked about that in week one, the posture of prayer. All these are online or on our app. You can check them out. Today, we're going to look at this third posture that he says, hey, if you, if you seek my presence, if you seek my presence, next week we'll turn to this one, turning their backs on their wicked lives. Here's the, the promise. He says, I'll be ready for you. Man, I, if you just, because we seek a lot of things in life. We go after a lot of things, but God says, if you ever get back to seeking my presence, I'll be ready to show up in your life. I'll be ready to move in your life, and I'll listen from heaven, forgive your sins, and restore your land to health, he says. I think there's a lot of confusion when we talk about seeking the presence of God, and there's a lot of maybe misunderstanding. I'm gonna clear a lot of it up today. But there is is more in the Bible, in the scriptures, about God's desire to be present with us than there is our desire or man's desire to be with God. Like, I want you to know that and let that settle in, that God wants to be with you more than you wanna be with him. Like God, God, that all throughout the Bible, it's just, it's this, you see this narrative of God desiring to be with man, created to be with mankind. Not in your notes. Let me give you a few scriptures. Not, you may want to write them down. Psalm 53 says that God is actually looking down from heaven on all of mankind to see if anyone understands, to see if anyone will seek him. He's looking going, man, will anyone seek my presence? He, he's looking for someone to seek him. Hebrews 11 and 6 says this, that without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So there are some promises that God has attached to this, this aspect, this idea of seeking his presence. Now, God isn't playing hide and seek. That's not why, we, why he wants you to seek him. He's like, come find me, come find me, try to find me. And if you find me, you get a prize. That's not the deal that's happening here. It's not about where God is. Check it out. It's about where you drifted. Okay, so he's, he's just, write this down. Mankind has always had this tendency to drift from the presence of God. 
All right, and, and so when we're talking about seeking his presence, it's just, it's, it's natural inside of every one of us to just drift away from God's presence, from, from being with, from what we were created to do. We have a tendency to drift. So God says, just, just keep seeking. If you just keep seeking me, I promise you, I'll be found by you. So here's what I want to do today, because there's so much confusion around this, and maybe just lack of understanding around this idea of the presence of God and seeking the presence of God. What I want to show you is, on, is the narrative of the Bible, of how throughout the scripture, from, from Genesis to New Testament, you guys, it has been this story, this narrative of God's presence. So if you will let me, I want to do a theology of God's presence with you, because I want to explain some things, give you proper understanding of the presence of God theologically, and what God has even revealed to us through his word about his desire to be with us, and then I'm going to tie it with some application for you. So, but let me give you some theology of the presence of God first to get, lay a good foundation. There are three, um, three landmarks, if you will, throughout the scriptures, Old Testament, um, of the presence of God that reveals about his desire. Write them down like this. The first presence is the garden presence. That's the, Adam and Eve were the first people of all creation, right? But this is, this is where they had this, I mean, they had it made, didn't they, Adam and I? They had this paradise. It was like their own personal retreat with God. The Bible says that God would walk in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. That, that here's what the garden presence, it, it reveals about God's desire. Write it down like this, that God wants to walk with you. I mean, that God actually wants to walk along size you. That's, that's his desire. That he created you to, to have fellowship, community with, and he wants to walk with you. Do, you. do you have, let me ask you a question, do you have like a garden area of your life? Do you have a retreat, a paradise where you can just sit with God, where you can hear God's voice, where you can just listen to his word, because God wants to walk with you. We see it in Genesis chapter 3, Verse eight, not only that God wants to walk with you, but that man's tendency to drift because Adam and Eve have it made, but they, as you guys know, and I'm gonna give you the, this theology of the presence is gonna go, we're gonna, we're gonna give a, a huge span of, of the Old Testament. Go there with me. But you guys know the story of Adam and Eve where they disobey God. And although they, were, they, they had it made, they, they fall away from, they drift from God's presence. And the Bible says, when the cool of the evening breeze was blowing the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking around in the garden. He would actually come and walk alongside. So what did they do? Because of their sin, because of their shame, because of their fear, they drifted. They hid from the Lord among the trees. So God created you like, and that's what represents the garden presence. The first time God's presence is known in the Bible is there in Genesis, that God wants to walk with you. The second place in the scriptures that really a landmark of God's presence, write it down like this, is the tabernacle presence. The tabernacle. So the, for those of you that don't know, the tabernacle was a, it was basically a portable church. So when Moses delivered God's people, the Jewish people from the Egyptians, and they, you know, walked through the Red Sea and, and, and all the Egyptians got, you guys seen the movie, right? You've seen the movie and they got, okay, so you know where I'm going with this, okay? So God gives Moses these exacting measurements to build him a church, to build him a portable tabernacle where his presence would be. And he, would give him, he gave him these exact measurements of the furnishings, but one of these furnishings was this veil, this curtain that would separate the, a holy place from the holy of holies where God's presence would literally dwell. And inside of that place in this tabernacle that they would build and they would wander all throughout the desert building and, and at night they would build it again and carry it with them and build it again and put it up again. Inside of the holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. The Bible says that actually there was a pillar of cloud by night and there would be a big pillar of fire uh, by night and a cloud by day that would actually lead the people that they wouldn't move. They would not move a step in the wilderness when Moses was leading them unless that pillar of fire or cloud went before them. That's the tabernacle, inside the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, right beyond the curtain where God's presence would dwell. Here's what it reveals to us about God's desire to be with us, that God wants to lead you. Like he, he wants to lead you by his presence. Did you know his presence can go before you and lead you? Like that's what he desires for our life to be in Proverbs chapter three, verse five says it like this, that we should trust in the Lord completely 
And, and he says, don't rely on your own opinions. Don't come up with your own opinions. Oh, this is what I think. And this is what I think we should do. And this is what they think we should do. God says, I don't want you to have to rely on your own opinions, but with all your heart, rely on him to guide you. And he will lead you in every decision you make. Well, how does he do that? By his presence. His presence was meant to, supposed to lead us through life, through every decision and every step that we would take. Exodus chapter 40 talks about it like this. It says that uh, Moses in the tabernacle, that the cloud of, that covered the tabernacle and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever you see the word, the glory of the Lord, that's another word for the presence of God. It's, it's described as that, that when the glory of God showed up, his presence showed up. But Moses, look at this, could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down on it. So although God desired to be with and to walk alongside and to lead, there was, there was just, it was too much even for Moses to handle. It was too much for Moses to be in that place when that cloud was over it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And it says, now whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out on their journey following it. But if the cloud did not rise, they remained where they were until it lifted. That they allowed the presence of God to lead them throughout this, this wilderness experience. Um, here's the third. The third presence that we see in the, in the scriptures, and that's the temple presence. The temple presence. Now, before I give you what that like, represents and what about God's desire uh, to be with us, let me kind of do some explaining about the, the temple, okay? Because King David, this is 400 years after Moses. 400 years after Moses, God has set up his people in the promised land. And, and he's setting up pretty nicely, actually. And King David gets to this place and he's like, hey, we still got the portable church going on here, this tabernacle thing, and it just doesn't seem right. He says in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David said to Nathan the prophet, Look, I'm living in a palace. I'm living good <laughs> in a palace made of cedar wood, but the ark of God is still in that tabernacle. Like I got this big old temple. I'm living good. And God's got this tent. He said, something's wrong with that. And then God tells him, God tells David, as I have moved with the Israelites, as I have moved in that tabernacle with you, I have never said to the tribes whom I've commanded to take care of my people of Israel, why haven't you built me a house of cedar? So here's what I want you to see in this, you guys. It was never God's idea to build a temple. That wasn't God's idea. It, was not, it wasn't God's plan to say, hey, I want some gold and some more things in here. Give me a, give. That wasn't God's plan. It was David's plan. And, and the reason why David even had this thought was because it was a pagan, it was a pagan idea. In the land they were living in, they had lots of temples. There was temples of different gods and statues and idol worship. And so David's looking on to these, these other lands and cultures and how they do religion and spirituality. He says, man, our God deserves that too. So David, our God actually um, tells David, sure, I'll let you do it, but it's going to be Solomon who I'm gonna, who's going to build my temple. But here's, here's the the requirement, I'm going to give you, you will, you're not going to make a temple like the other temples you see in this land. This temple, there will not be anyone. You will worship and serve no other God before me. Only the one true God will you worship. And if you do that, you can make a temple. But I'm the only, I'm the only God you will serve and you will worship. But Solomon does. He builds it. And a lot of you know this, this story here throughout the scriptures. He builds it. It's great. He actually have a lot of success in the favor of God. But uh, Solomon takes 700 wives. Someone say trouble. Come on, somebody. <laughs> 700 wives from foreign lands. And with these wives come with the, their religions and their, their, their spiritual practices. And he's, he, he, he starts, you know, giving in to them and saying, okay, we can have a temple for that God that you worship too. Okay, we can, we can make a statue for that God. And okay, okay. And, and, and after years, there's just temples and idol worship all throughout the land. So God does exactly what he said he would do. And he humbles the nation and he raises up King Nebuchadnezzar and King Nebuchadnezzar comes in and destroys the Israelites, destroys the temple, the temple of God, where the holy, where his presence would do it. He destroys it. And takes people even captive and, 
And years later, they try to rebuild it, but it's nothing. It's like nothing compared to the glory of of their heyday, of Israelite heyday, Solomon's temple. And, and one of the prophets, Haggai, actually prophesies in the rebuilding of the temple. He says, does anyone remember this house, this temple, in all its splendor? Like back when we did it, when, God's, when God let Solomon build, does anyone remember that? How in comparison does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. Like it was nothing compared to what it used to be. And then he gives this prophecy. He says, in just a little while, I will again shake the heavens and the earth, the oceans and the dry land. I will shake all the nations. So God is saying, look, it's actually beyond even people's imagination or understanding what God actually wanted to do with his presence and his people that that he said, man, what I want to do with my temple is so earth shaking, heaven shaking, like you can't even comprehend and fathom what I want to do with my temple. Okay, enter Jesus now, who was the God made flesh, the spotless lamb of God who died for the redemption of our souls who was the sacrifice for our sins. And on the cross, Jesus, his last breath and his last words, Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And look at this. It says, at that moment, that veil in the temple that separated all the people from just the certain qualified priests that could enter the Holy of Holies, it says that temple was torn from top to bottom. And at that moment, the prophecy of Haggai was fulfilled. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. That God's spirit was now made available to all people was not refined to a certain place. Acts 17 says it this way, verse 24. It says that the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. Look at this. And he does not live in temples built by human hands. Do you know that there is nothing special about this place that you are sitting in right now? This church, this is not, this is not a temple. This is not a sanctuary. This is one of the, one of the common misunderstandings that will keep Christ's followers from truly seeking the presence of God is thinking it's somewhere you go. God's presence does not dwell in this place. And this is why I want to take a moment and share with you the theology that yes, God wants to walk with you. Yes, God wants to lead you. But this temple presence that was just, it was a picture of something. It was a type and a shadow of what God always wanted. Write it down this way. That God wants to dwell inside you. That, that when that temple, when Jesus gave up his life on that cross and the, the veil was torn from top to bottom, God's spirit burst from that place and is made available to dwell inside of every person. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 says it like this. Do you not know? that this thing ain't the church. This thing ain't the temple. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? That God actually, his whole plan from the very beginning, from the very beginning, it wasn't his idea. His plan from the very beginning was always to make a way to live inside of you so that he can walk with you and lead you and, and empower you. Who is in you, he said, whom you have received from God. That God... Man, his spirit dwells inside of you. And that was always his plan. So, so let, me, let me go back to the beginning now of seeking my presence. How then, how do we seek his presence if it's something we've been given? Is it something we, we already have? Let me give you the three, the three, the three uh, some more theology here. I know I'm going all over the place. Three aspects of God's presence that you need to, that you need to know. Number one, that God is omnipresent. How many of you ever heard that before? Omnipresent? What that means is that he's everywhere at all times. He's omnipresent, that he, he, you can ne- he will never leave you nor forsake you. That David actually said, he wrote in the Psalms, where can I go from your presence? Even if I would make my bed in hell, I can't get away from you, he says. Like God is everywhere at all times. He is omnipresent. So, so when God says, I want you to seek my presence, you can't seek an om- you can't. He's not talking about seeking his omnipresence. You can't, he's there, he's there. So what is he talking about then? How about this one? Here's the second part of God's presence that you need to know is the inner presence. He, is, he dwells within us. We have, we have 
the, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been given to us, the Bible says, as a seal of the promise that we have redemption in Jesus Christ, that we are his. And you'll never, he, he ain't going anywhere. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He is with you because of Jesus, not because of anything you can do. You don't deserve it. You can't, you can't earn this. It actually has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with believing in Jesus. By grace through faith, you've been given this spirit. So, so, we, so we can't seek his presence that constantly indwells us. So what is this? What, is it, what does it mean to seek his presence then? It's not his omnipresence. It's not, it's not the presence that lives and makes us a temple of the Holy Spirit. Here's the third aspect of his presence that you need to know. His manifest presence. His manifest presence. Now, when I even say that word, some of you, depending on your backgrounds or maybe your, your, your perspectives, you know, experiences, I don't know what your mind goes to when I say manifest. But it's, it's, all it means is the made, known, realized presence among us. That God, and this is the presence that God desires you to seek of him. He, he wants to be, listen, he wants to be made known and realized in your life. He wants to be made known and realized the tangible presence of God. This is what he desires us to seek. And honestly, this is our greatest privilege. It's our greatest privilege as Christians, as believers in Jesus, to be people who, who, can, who host this who God rests upon, the, his, his manifest presence. See, God indwells every one of us. He indwells us. And he, and he indwells every one of us for our own benefit, for personal benefit, okay? But he, he, his manifest presence rests upon us, not for our own benefit. It's actually for the benefit of others. And, that's, and this, is, this is a presence that you can actually drift from. You can't drift from the omnipresence. You can't get away from God. You can't, you can't even drift from the inner and dwelling of the Holy Spirit. Man, he is with you. He is the seal. He will never leave you nor forsake you. But what we can drift from is the glory of God made known in our life. And Moses knew this. Exodus chapter 33, when God tells him, the Lord replied, my presence, Moses, will go with you into that promised land and I will give you rest. And Moses replied, if your presence does not go with us, don't send us from here. Isn't that amazing that Moses is looking out to the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. And he goes, I don't want the promise if I don't have the presence. I don't want any of what this world has to offer. I don't want any of it unless you go with me, God. It's not worth it. I love that. How many times do we compromise the presence of God because of the promises? And often they end up being empty promises, don't they? promise of pleasure, promise of riches, promise of security, promises that hold no water without the presence of God. Amen. He says, if your presence doesn't go with us, and then look at this. He says, how will anyone know that you're pleased with me and with your people unless your presence is among us? Hey, what else, he says, what else will distinguish me and your people? What makes us any different from all the other people on the face of the earth? If the manifest, made known, realized glory of God isn't with us, then what is the difference? Right. You see, Paul, Paul said, I want, I want to know God in the power of his resurrection. That's the manifest presence. That's the made known, realized presence of God in your life. He said, when I preach, I don't want to use wise or persuasive words. I want a demonstration of God's power. That's the manifest presence of God. How many of you want to seek the presence of God in here? I want to see the manifest presence, the glory of God made known and realized in your life. You can be. And this is one of the, one of the greatest privileges of, of, of our lives as disciples, as followers of Jesus, is to, is to host that, is to, is to allow the manifest, the glory of God to walk with us. And this is what he means when he says, seek my presence. He's, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's everywhere at all times. And he's actually inside of you. He's dwelling and living inside of you. But he wants to be made known by you. Amen, somebody? Amen. He wants to be made known. He wants, he, he wants when people like look at your life, he wants them to say something's different. Something is distinguishably different about that person. 
about their, about their hope, about their joy, about their peace, about the way that things just work out, about something is different, about something is distinguishably different. It's the manifest presence of God on our life. And if you want to seek that, if you want to seek that manifest presence, now let me give you some application of how. Now I give you the theology, all right? The theology of the presence of God, because there's a lot of confusion about it. I hope you understand it now that God wants to be with you, and he wants to be made known, realized, tangibly glorified in your walk and in your life day to day. That's what he means. If you want that in your life, here are some steps that you can take. Number one, pray and worship God wherever you are. In whatever season you are, wherever you are, we have to learn how to pray and worship God wherever you are. Because you may be in today, you may be in a drought. You may be in a bad season. You may be experiencing trouble or temptation or trial. You may have experienced a bad breakup. Or maybe you just got some bad news from a friend, a doctor, a something. These things can, can rob us of uh, take from us, cause us to stop seeking God. And for some people, our, our, our relationship with God is very circumstantial. It flows with the emotions. It flows with the circumstances. It flows with the news that we get or that we, we don't receive. But no matter where you are, what season you're in, if you want to experience God's presence, you have to seek him through prayer and worship. Um, Acts chapter 16, in your handout, Paul and Silas find themselves in a difficult season. They were just beaten and flogged for preaching the gospel. They got thrown into prison, and right there at about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was Look at the manifest, the glory of God showed up in that prison cell. Such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. See, some of you are allowing the, the pains of life to rob you of your praise and take you out of God's presence. But, but what you don't realize is that pain is actually one of the greatest catalysts to experiencing the presence of God in your life. I'm preaching now, okay? So, so God will allow some things to happen in your life because pain strips away pride. Ooh, ah, pain, will, it'll strip what you thought you were, but know in the middle of the pain when it all comes crumbling down, you know you're not. It strips away our pride. It strips away our pretensions. And if we just allow it, pain can produce some amazing revelation. There is deeper healing in our pain than there is in a lot of things in life. That some of us are allowing it. We're allowing these pains and these circumstances to cause us to stop our praise and remove us from the presence of God. But because they prayed and they sang and worshiped God's manifest presence was made known, wasn't it? That, and it wasn't, listen, it wasn't for them. The manifest presence of God is not for you. It's not for me to feel good. That's not. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and he intercedes for us, and he's with us, and he's walking. But the manifest, when God manifests himself, and he is made known and realized in your life and on your life, it's never just for you. It's always for those around you. It's always, God, Moses knew it. He said, what else is going to say? Don't go with us because there needs to be a distinguishing mark on our life that when people look on, on on these people that they know we're different, that we serve the one true God. God wants to be made known in your life. How does he do that? By the manifest presence of God, the glory of God on your life. And what happened when God showed up in that prison shell, in the cell in the middle of that pain? the earthquake, the shaking, and all the prison cells were loose. If you go read that story, the jailer actually comes to Jesus Christ and gives his life to Christ. Why? Because God showed up. Because the glory of God showed up in the midst of their prayer, in the midst of their praising, and their singing. There is, listen to me, there are different personalities in here. There is no other access point to the manifest presence of God that does not include worship. That if you want to experience this glory, if you want to fulfill this word of God and God's desire to be with you, to be made known in your life, then you need to get free in your worship. You need to get free in in, in the expression of your worship. 
in the freedom of your worship. Look what it says, a few scriptures not in your notes. In Psalm 100, it says this, make a joyful shout to the Lord. All the earth, serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with what? With singing. They were singing and praying hymns and God showed up. Psalm 22 says, bring God praise and then you'll find. See, that's why the enemy wants to shut your mouth. The enemy in the middle of the season and circumstance and the pain or that trial or that failure or that whatever that is, what the enemy even meant for, for harm, God can turn it in for good if you just praise him. Praise precedes your victory. Come on, somebody. Seek his presence. Pray and worship. Pray. If you just bring God praise, you'll find him. Your hearts will overflow, the scriptures say, forever. Forever. So if you want to be someone who seeks his presence, where, that just, where you're marked, man. You're marked. Your life is marked. That there's something just glory around you and about you and in you and throughout you and things you touch and the people you're around and relationships you have. You got to be a person who knows how to pray and worship in every season, in every situation, wherever you are. It's not, it's, it's honestly not an event you come to. It's a lifestyle you live. Romans chapter 12, it talks about the lifestyle of worship. It's worth just reading again. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. See, it's not just the praise, that's not just the hymn. It's actually, it's actually the daily sacrifice. This is your true and proper worship. And then he says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able... So when you, when you posture yourself this way in praise and worship, true worship, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. See, a lot of times we look for God to bring the breakthrough in a moment, but what if God wanted to work your breakthrough out in a process? A process of your praise, a process of your worship, a process of your prayer that as you daily offer yourself to God, that he works and goes before you his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Pray and worship wherever you are, wherever you are in every season, no matter what you're experiencing. Don't be tossed by the waves. Don't be up and down. Don't be fickle because of circumstances. Learn how to praise in the middle of your prison. Learn how to praise in the middle of your pain. There's great revelation there. I promise you there is. There's some great revelation in the middle of your pain. Here's the second thing. If we want to seek God's presence, make his presence your priority. Is, is his presence, is like his presence in your life a priority? Is it something you are seeking after? Can I ask you this? Is there anything better than the presence of God? No. I mean, if you, those of you that have experienced it can say, yeah, no way there's nothing better than the presence of God. There is nothing in all creation that is better than this presence that we get to host, walk with and be led by and be filled with this glory. There is nothing better. Did you know that there are angels constantly singing holy, 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 holy is the Lord God, like constantly in this praise and worship. I used to think, man, don't they get tired of that? Anyone with me ever think like, don't they ever get tired? Like, can we get a break, God, and just get some water? Or can we go visit some other parts of the universe that you created? I'd love to see some other, something else. Did you know that they never want to ever do that? There is nothing in all creation that is greater than the creator itself. He is, he is worthy. He is holy. There is nothing that is that's better than his presence. David sings about it in one of the Psalms, Psalm chapter 42. He says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Isn't that a beautiful picture that my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go? When can I get back to that place where I can meet with God? Oh, my soul. I looked up one of the words for, for pant in uh, Webster's Dictionary is to long eagerly or yearn. To long eagerly or yearn. I don't know if you've ever been so thirsty, like you just, you, you couldn't help but keep thinking about water, right? Have you ever been so thirsty, you're like, get me some water. Where is the water, right? I, I have. And, and this, what does this have to do with prioritizing God's presence? It has everything to do with prioritizing God's presence because when you're thirsty, no one needs to convince you to get a drink. No, no. You are driven by your thirst to go get your drink when you're thirsty. See, it's, 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 about, 
It's about, the pa- you, it's about the passion that we have. When you are passionate about something, it becomes a natural priority. But when you're not passionate about it, it you, you're cold, indifferent. It's a chore now when you're not passionate about it. Prioritizing God's presence really has nothing to do with your schedule. It has nothing to do with how busy you are. It has everything to do with how thirsty you are. How thirsty is your soul panting? for the water of God's presence. God, I, as you are a vital need in my life that I do not want to move from this place. And I know none of us would in ever in a million years utter these words like, God, I don't need you on a daily basis. God, I can effectively do my day-to-day life without your presence. None of us would ever say that, but many of us live that way right. without even realizing it, right? We don't realize it, we just, we're, but we're living that way. If you want to be people who are seeking God's presence and, and, and who are marked by this, the, manif- the glory of God on your life, then you need to make it a priority in your life, that his presence is a priority. And here's the last one I'm going to give you. Number three is to continually surrender your life. Continually surrender your life. You see, surrendering is not a battle of your will. It's actually an act of worship. That's what surrender is. Surrendering is an act of worship. It's a constant surrender. And in life, your life can only be lived in this moment. We are physical beings. You only can be lived in this moment. So what is it? What is it in this moment that's preventing you from surrendering to God? What in this moment is preventing you from trusting him completely, from giving up, from letting go and letting God work? You see, when we're surrendering our life and we've surrendered our life to God, we're, we're letting him, we're following his lead without knowing where he's sending us. We're, we're waiting on his timing without knowing when it's going to come. We're expecting a miracle without knowing how God's going to provide. We're, we're trusting God's purposes, not understanding completely the circumstances. You know you're surrendered to God when you, when you just stop, when you surrender when you stop trying to manipulate and control the situation. You stop trying harder and you just trust more. Some of you need to do that today. That's a word for somebody today. Hey, stop trying harder. Stop trying so hard like it depends on you and it relies upon you. Why don't you just trust God more? Why don't you just seek his presence as your vital need? Why don't you let him go before you? Let him lead you. Let him fill you. Let him empower you. Hebrews 13 and 15 says, Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice. That's what worship is. A continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. Jude chapter 1, 24 actually says, this is why it's a constant surrender. It says, To him, that is Jesus, who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you before his glorious presence. You see, I can't, I can't stand before God in my own strength, in my own accolades, in my own, in my own righteousness. No, no, no. The reason why we have to constantly surrender is the only way I can stand in that presence is if Jesus carries me, Amen. is if Jesus presents me. That's the only way. I cannot stand before God on my own. No, I'm a, I need to surrender. He can present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. You were created for this, you guys. You were created to walk with God, to be led by him. You were created to have his very essence and nature and spirit dwell within you. And then not only that, he wanted to be made known in your life in such a way that is so glorious, that is so powerful, that he would go before you and be the distinguishing mark on your life. Here, write it down this way. You were not created to live with theory. Bunch of ideas, thoughts, principles, theology, information. You were not created to live with theory. You were created to experience his manifest, made known, realized, and tangible, glorified presence. That's what you were made for. That's what God's plan was from the very beginning. And guess what? It's available for every one of you if you would just seek his presence. 
Come on, let's bow our heads all across this worship center. I want to pray for you.